Let's begin this presentation on 1 Peter, uh, which will be pretty brief, with a prayer. God of holy messages, we are a people of letters, people united across time and space by words that we have written down and sent to one another to encourage one another to guide one another. We thank you for the holy message of a letter like 1 Peter. And we pray now that you would use its words to encourage us and to guide us. To encourage us and guide us in our places and in our time. To empower us to share these words with others. To encourage them in their places and in times still to come. Amen. Got a image here, um, a medieval one, of Jesus' descent to Hades, which is actually a part of the Apostles' Creed and something that has a traditional basis in this first letter of Peter. So we'll get to that uh, at the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4. The letter begins in a conventional way, sender, recipients, and a greeting. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen and destined by God the Father and sanctified by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in abundance. So what is the dispersion? It is the dispersion of the people of the God of Israel to these regions that you see on the screen, this map of Asia Minor as we call this uh, landmass today. Now, are the recipients exiles because they were not born in these Roman provinces of Asia Minor that are on the screen? No. Are all of the recipients Jewish? The letter indicates that they're not. It assumes that the Recipients have come from a Gentile background. So the recipients, as I read the language here, are now exiles because they belong to the people of the God of Israel and so live as foreigners among other peoples of the world who are serving other gods and living under Gentile rulers. So according to this language of First Peter, in the way that he addresses the recipients, there's a sense in which we should know ourselves as exiles where we are living today because we serve the God of Israel and the Lord Jesus. Whether that is in political orders called the United States or Ghana or Singapore or Angola, or Taiwan, whatever the claims to the contrary, such political orders are not neatly our home, our home order, or our natural order as people who serve the one true God, the God of Israel. And so we are more closely related to others, regarded as foreigners, where we're living, than we are to citizens in this way, even if we meet the criteria that have been devised for citizenship in the political orders where we find ourselves. Should we become too much at home in the orders in which we are living so that we begin to relate to them as a territory or political order that is ours by nature or by right and one that we must protect against foreigners? 
then I think we will have succumbed to the myths of Western modernity and forgotten that we ourselves are exiles of the dispersion, according to 1 Peter. I don't want to overstate this matter because there are healthy ways of being Christian citizens of the political orders in which we find ourselves, and I don't think that we want to fail to invest uh, in the lives of our neighbors or in our places by claiming that we don't belong where and when we are. Nor do we want to deny how we are in fact invested in the political orders in which we find ourselves, and therefore, to varying degrees, responsible or culpable for the challenges that people have inherited who live with us in them. But as Christians, we cannot let the terms that have defined these political orders their various kinds of borders define us. We serve the one true God who is the God of all people in all places. People, uh, we are uh, of a kingdom that has come but is also still coming. And so there are various ways in which as Christians we're called to defy the boundaries fixed by the political orders that have claimed us. And in that sense, we remain exiles or foreigners committed to oneness with other foreigners, others who are not allowed quite to belong to the political orders in which we live, others who find that they cannot thrive well enough in them and know them as home. You can tell that my interpretation varies from what may have been intuitive uh, to you or was standard uh, in the way that you have heard this text in the past, and that is that we're exiles on the earth because we're going to heaven uh, in the future. And I don't think that actually fits what exile means here. Exile is a political category relative to these Roman provinces where the intended recipients of the letter find themselves. So they're foreigners not because they're uh, going to heaven and don't belong on the earth. They're foreigners because the political orders where they are residing are not uh, the final orders uh, to which they belong. Uh, they are uh, part of a kingdom of priests, for example, as we'll read further on in the letter. Uh, they're part of a coming kingdom of God uh, and so uh, that's the sense in which they are exiles and foreigners where they're currently living. I think it's a political statement about how they are engaging the societies in which they find themselves. Peter, as we read, addresses us as exiles and chosen, specifically to be exiles and to be chosen by God the Father, and uh, these go together, to be exiles and to be chosen by God the Father. How do they go together? Well, to be chosen by the God of Israel is not to be a people that has a right to exist. It's not to be a people authorized to destroy its enemies. It's not to be a people that will dominate others. It is to be the people that serves the God of Israel in and through our instability and weakness. It is to serve God as exiles. That is who we are as people who worship this God in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's the life of service for which God has chosen us. And that's how being chosen and being exiles go together. So you can see that to be chosen by God in contrast to what is often implied by that claim is not to pursue a manifest destiny of stealing land and mercilessly destroying others if they don't act like our doormat. It is to be destined by God the Father to be obedient to Jesus Messiah. It's not to be the pilgrims authorized by God to inhabit and confiscate a new land according to 
the lie of the mythology of the Thanksgiving holiday here in the U.S. It is instead to be sanctified, set apart and purified by the Spirit to serve Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with His blood. It's to be exiles forgiven by God and possessed by the Spirit so as to spread that life of forgiveness wherever we live. It's to be in the way we live and die as foreigners, the seed of life that God casts throughout the world, a life that points to the coming life when the world will not be the place of the exiles of the dispersion, but the home of God's humanity. This is a life, as Peter will teach us now, of suffering. How are we to live this life? Well, the first section, Peter tells us, let us be disciplined in fear, hope, and love in accordance with the life that the God of Israel has given us. And I've tried to track this in two subsections. First, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a blessing uh, in lieu of a thanksgiving that appears at this point. Uh, so blessed be this God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has mercifully given us a new life through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and is keeping an unassailable future of salvation for us. We may rejoice in this coming deliverance as we suffer in the present because the testing of our faith leads to glory and the salvation of our lives. The prophets of old spoke of this salvation according to the Spirit of Messiah in them. This is the same Holy Spirit from heaven by which the gospel of their hope has been brought to us. So as we're moving through the letter here, Something you might want to do is to pause the presentation as you might have done in the past and to read the section that my interpretive statement covers and then uh, sort of weigh whether you're reading how well it matches the flow that I've tried to express in my kind of interpretive gloss on the section. So as we continue here, according to this blessing, we find ourselves in the climax of the promised revelation of the God of Israel in time. And so we are to live, as this next section says, starting in verse 13, with discipline, according to the salvation in which we find ourselves, abandoning the ignorance of our former ways and being holy as God is holy. So you see how the language of Israel itself uh, is being adopted here for the readers to be holy as God is holy. We're to live in exile in reverent fear of the God who is God of all. We're to live in hope because our transformation is unshakable. The mutual love of our salvation is the fruit of the enduring word of the Lord at work in us and among us, so let us leave behind our destructive tendencies and come to Jesus as part of the living Israelite temple of God, whose cornerstone is the stone of stumbling. So this is a picture of the kind of life we live as exiles uh, in the political orders in which we find ourselves, in the midst of them, we are to be God's temple, uh, which is serving in a priestly way uh, those places. And now really what um, is the main, I think, uh, section of the letter. So even though we are exiles, Peter urges us, uh, we are to live honorably among the Gentiles as the temple, household of God, ordered by the nonviolent love of the Messiah so that these Gentile peoples may come to glorify God uh, as and when God comes to judge. 
So this uh, hopefully echoes what I said earlier about the need for our understanding, our self-understanding as exiles to be coupled with an abiding commitment to invest in the life of our neighbors and our places, uh, not to be sort of floating above our places as if being exiles mean we weren't committed to them. Uh, that, I think, is quite at odds with the way Peter is calling us to be exiles. And in using this temple language to describe the sort of life that we're to live um, as foreigners, uh, where we find ourselves, Peter uses the uh, language of household, uh, some of the key categories of household that we began to look at in Ephesians. Um, household, remember, is not where a nuclear family lives, but a term for uh, kind of the unit of political economy, the principal unit, which is a domestic economy where uh, homes of multiple generations of a family, including slaves, would be places of not just economic consumption, the way that homes tend to be today, but also of economic production, so that there is um, an abiding concern with the dynamics of life in the household order. And some of the key categories of the household we looked at uh, in Ephesians, drawing especially on Aristotle, and you'll see some of those same categories come up here. It's crucial, I think, that we uh, recognize that that is the kind of political economic structure that the readers have inherited, and Peter is teaching them how to operate within it, in many ways subverting that structure with an abiding concern for how this household life uh, of the community is affecting the Gentile societies among whom they live. So all of these, I think, are especially concerned with the sort of witness to Gentile society that the communities uh, addressed in this letter are living. So the first uh, one, you'll recognize some similar pattern here from First Timothy, uh, a kind of general guide here to be subject to every human-made authority for the Lord's sake. There's a not-so-subtle distinction here, though, in that as we are subject to every human-made authority, we are to fear God, not fear the king, and we can give some honor to the king. So I think that there is a subordination of human kings here to our fear of God. Next, uh, slaves be subject to your masters following the suffering of Messiah. Uh, and so reading this section here, we see uh, Peter saying, uh, something that draws very specifically on the way that uh, Jesus lived as the Messiah to guide those who have inherited a uh, condition of oppression. So he writes, uh, Slaves, uh, receive the authority of your masters with deference, not only those who are kind and gentle, but also those who are harsh. Uh, so don't hold even those in contempt, for it is a credit to you if being aware of God you endure pain while suffering unjustly. So this is something that you are able to do, you can tell here, by the fear of God uh, rather than the fear only of uh, corrupt human authorities. So uh, a power that comes from those authorities being themselves subject to God and our serving God. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, verse 20 says, what credit is that? Uh, you don't want to be getting in trouble because you are doing evil. But if you endure when you do right and suffer for that, then especially you have God's approval you are on a course of blessing 
Verse 21, For to this you have been called, because Messiah also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was, in his, was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Verse 24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins we might live for justice. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your lives. So I think that is worth reading because of how specifically this guidance draws upon Jesus' way of facing corrupt authorities, of facing abuse, and uh, here, once again, um, what we've sometimes thought of primarily in terms of atonement, Jesus bearing our sins in his body on the cross, is functioning here as a guide for how we are to face uh, oppression. And uh, so atonement is not just this kind of innocent uh, theory out there about uh, how Christ's death did something for us in a transactional way. Uh, the atonement is unfolding in the way that we negotiate inherited differences of power that uh, may even involve uh, suffering for us. And Peter wants us to suffer here for the right reasons and not for the wrong reasons and to follow the example of Jesus uh, in the way that we relate to corrupt authorities here, of course, addressing especially the condition of slaves, who you can probably understand would be uh, certainly uh, expected, you might say, uh, to hold their masters in contempt, to return abuse for abuse, uh, to threaten them when they are threatened or caused to suffer. And this is not the way actually to change the game, Peter says. Uh, instead, the game-changing reality revealed in Christ is the one where uh, we don't retaliate in the same way, but live uh, in a way that entrusts ourselves to the one who judges justly, uh, to God, and that is going to inform the way that we offer resistance to corrupt power over our lives. Uh, you might just remember the wisdom of others who have uh, embraced this difficult path in telling us that in the resistance that they offer, the point is not uh, primarily to humiliate uh, or insult or simply throw off the oppressor. Uh, it is actually to seek a transformed relationship so that uh, a cycle of reprisal is avoided and instead uh, there is a path that is being cut to peace by the way, uh, in this case, people I'm thinking of like um, King and others in the way that people bear Christian witness in the face of oppressive power. Still hard to hear, though, uh, and I don't think there are any easy answers about how this works, and I'd remind you of the vulnerability of these kinds of texts to being abused so as to justify the subjection of slaves to masters, and that, I think, would be a poor reading, but a reading to which this text does lend itself. The next section here um, of household dynamics 3, 1 to 7, wives be subject to your husbands and husbands treat your wives, the text says, as co-heirs of the life of grace. And I don't think the language here implies that the um, wives uh, as helpers or as bearing a certain kind of weakness are kind of 
generally speaking, the weaker sex or something like that for the writer. Instead, um, they are members of household order who uh, find themselves having inherited unnecessary conditions of weakness. Conditions that, while unnecessary, are nevertheless very real and uh, contingent on the circumstances in which they're living. And uh, Peter urges husbands to bear that in mind so as not to further victimize them or exploit them. And even go so far as to say that the efficacy of our prayers depends on our refusal to reinforce uh, this kind of oppression of wives and depends uh, consequently on our acting for their liberation. So this uh, seems to be, again, the way that Peter is urging uh, these exiles to live among the Gentiles uh, in no doubt mixed households often so it's not going to be exclusively Christian households they are relating to Gentile people across some of these lines of power so that they find themselves often as subordinates and uh, this is a context in which Peter is urging the community uh, to suffer for the right reasons rather than the wrong reasons to follow Jesus' example and to bear with these oppressive forms of authority wisely. I take the next section to be a kind of almost a summary guide for how we are to live a life of unity and love for one another, repaying abuse not with abuse but with blessing and trusting the Lord to judge. So the expectation here is that the Gentile societies in which the recipients are living are uh, under the pressure of God's judgment, and that needs to affect how uh, the community inhabits uh, that Gentile society. So in the face of the kind of goal of the cosmos that is already being uh, revealed. We are to live a life of unity and love for one another rather than contentiousness. Um, following Jesus' example of responding to abuse uh, even with the outlandish effort to bless. And this is a expression of our trusting the Lord to judge rather than usurping judgment uh, as something we are supposed to do. Finally, all of you, it says, have unity of spirit, sympathy, love for one another, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse, but on the contrary, repay with a blessing. It's for this that you are called, that you might inherit a blessing. For those who desire life and desire to see good days, let them keep their tongue from evil and their lips from speaking deceit. Let them turn away from evil and do good. Let them seek peace and pursue it, for the eyes of the Lord are on the just, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Quote there from Psalm 34. So um, following this kind of general guide for the sort of life that we are to live in uh, mixed households in which we are engaging Gentiles directly across some of these household relationships, we hear uh, this general call placed in the story of Jesus and in a rather striking way uh, because it's not part of Jesus' story that uh, many of us have grown up emphasizing, and that is what we might call Holy Saturday, uh, what Jesus is doing while he is dead, as it were, or what his death is involved in. This is a big part of the theology and spirituality of the uh, Eastern Church of the Christian faith, not as prominent at all in the Western Church. But this is what Peter tells us. He uh, says that this 
life of uh, unity and repaying abuse with blessing, this life of love for one another, is following um, the story of the Messiah in the way that the Messiah faced death, in the way that the Messiah was dead. He showed us how to suffer by the way he descended to the dead as the just for the unjust. That's the dynamic in which the readers find themselves in a life of calling uh, or having been called to justice even while living under the um, oppressive power of the unjust. Here's how it reads. Um, and what I want you to keep in mind is what I've already in hinted at is as you're reading these very peculiar words talking about Jesus descending to spirits in prison and things like that, don't lose sight of the purpose for which Peter is telling this story. There's a rhetorical pastoral purpose that is at work in the telling of this story of Jesus descending to the dead and proclaiming to the disobedient uh, a message, it seems, of hope, of liberation. And this, of course, is going to prepare for the next phase of the argument in First Peter. So keep in mind, not just, you know, don't get caught up only in the sort of mysterious words that we're about to read, but why is Peter writing them? To what end is he writing them? There's a purpose um, that I've tried to sum up in what I've already said and uh, Messiah showing us how to suffer as the one who is suffering as the just for the unjust. Now, Peter writes, Who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? That is not typically the way that we attract uh, malice from people. We usually attract it more readily by doing evil to people. But, of course, there are cases in which we attract harm by doing what is good. So Peter continues, but even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear and do not be intimidated, but in your heart sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you in the way that you are living in these Gentile societies. Yet when you are making your defense, do it with gentleness, verse 16 says, and reverence. Keep your conscience clear, so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame, because the justice of your life is undeniable, and therefore their injustice is exposed. For it is better to suffer for doing good if suffering should be God's will, then to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, the just for the unjust, in order to bring you to God. Here comes that story. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water, and baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for good conscience. Remember that from verse 16, in the way that we make our defense and function under oppressive authorities with gentleness and reverence. Uh, this is uh, what keeps our conscience clear, and that is what our baptism itself was an appeal to God for, a good conscience through this power, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven after this descent, and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. So notice that the end of the story is not sort of unending subjection to slave masters or other kinds of oppressive authorities, but the exaltation of Christ uh, so that 
the highest of created powers find themselves subject to him. There's a reversal here. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, for one, arm yourselves also with the same intention. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has finished with sin, which is to say uh, has uh, developed the power so that sin does not enslave that person and drive their contemptuous behavior drive their loss of conscience, uh, suffering in the flesh, and the way that Christ did actually undermines the hold of that kind of sin. And so we are to arm ourselves with the same intention so as to live for the rest of our fleshly life, no longer by human desires, sort of cast about by uh, the whims of our desires in passing moments, but by the will of God. This is what gives us steadfastness in conditions of difficulty and living under oppressive power. You've already spent enough time in doing what the Gentiles like to do, verse 3 says, living in licentiousness, passions, drunkenness, revels, carousing, and lawless idolatry. This is part of the reason I say this letter is addressed to people of a Gentile background. These people that you uh, used to live among and doing these kinds of things are surprised. Verse 4 tells us that you're no longer joining them in the same excesses of dissipation, and so they slander, literally blaspheme. They speak evil about you uh, because of your withdrawal from these abusive patterns of life. But they will have to give an account an accounting to him who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. And again, a key verse that closes up this uh, storytelling that is to inform our way of facing suffering. For this is the reason the gospel was proclaimed even to the dead. So not just to the unjust, but even to the dead, so that though they had been judged in the flesh, as everyone is judged, they might live in the Spirit as God does. This is what God does for the dead. So if indeed you must suffer, Peter says, continue the suffering of Christ, whose justice shamed his oppressors, whose righteousness availed for the unrighteous, and whose death gave way to life in the Spirit, the resurrection and exaltation above all powers. That is the power of your life now, Peter says. And so the pattern of our suffering. In suffering this way, you have left behind your former Gentile ways. Not even the Gentiles can sustain those ways because Christ has delivered the dead from their judgment according to human beings so that they might live according to God by the Spirit. God is not leaving the Gentiles alone to deteriorate in these conditions. God has placed you among them as a witness uh, because God seeks their life by the spirit of resurrection. So the idea here is not to suffer for suffering's sake. And suffering because you've done evil is not the suffering to which God calls you. The suffering that follows Christ is suffering as the price of nonconformity with injustice, the price of resisting the injustice that we and others have inherited. And with that, we can transition to the next uh, subsection of this main thread, central part of the letter. If indeed you must suffer, continue the suffering of Christ, uh, whose justice shamed his oppressors, uh, this we covered. Um, so uh, we want to engage in this sort of subversive uh, way of relating to oppressive power. As we do persevering and rejoicing in suffering, this is now 4.12 to 19, as Christians, rather than as lawless people, Uh, because that kind of suffering is a sign of blessing. Don't despair, Peter warns us, at the prosperity of your persecutors, for if the judgment begins with the household of God, there's that key language that Peter 
uses uh, for our life, imagine what it will mean for them. So God is not going to continue to prosper oppressors, persecutors. Eventually, uh, they will self-destruct, and that will be the manifestation of God's judgment. So as we are avoiding this temptation to despair, perhaps, uh, as we observe the prosperity of those who persecute us, we are to... Now in 5, 1 and following, let the elders lead willingly and by example in hopes of the enduring crown of glory. Let the young of the community be subject to the elders. Let the community as a whole be humble in hopes of God's exalting them. Disciplined against the prowling devil as you suffer like your Christian family and the rest of the world. You're not enduring this alone. And as Peter has, of course, already been telling us, the hope for exaltation uh, through a kind of steadfastness and even humility, uh, that hope comes from what we have learned uh, from Jesus, what we have learned about Jesus, uh, who endured what he endured and then was exalted. With this, we come to the close, uh, the sort of restatement of the purpose of this letter, a final exhortation, and a closing greeting along with a prayer. So, once again, to uh, Christ be power uh, forever and ever. Uh, this is the life for which we're living and the hope of our own exaltation. Uh, through Silvanus, Peter writes, whom I consider a faithful brother, I've written this short letter to encourage you. That's the purpose, to testify that this is the true grace of God. This is the way of God's gifts. Stand fast in it. Your sister church in Babylon, interesting way of designating uh, where the writer is um, addressing this letter from, chosen together with you, this sister church sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Messiah. So that's just a brief introduction to 1 Peter, hopefully give you a, a sense of what its main kind of contours are and a few hints on how to uh, come at some of the challenging uh, parts of the letter. Hope you found it helpful. If you have any uh, reaction to it in the forum, I'll look forward to, uh, look forward to reading it. Or, as the case may be, uh, hearing your voice give it on a short video that you may post to the forum.